Hello, everyone. Uh, this lecture will be covering uh, chapter three of the studio book as we um, make our way through it. So, uh, a reminder, we will make our way through the, uh, the whole text in, in the next few weeks. So um, get ready. Here we go. Chapter three. Uh, and I did want to give you guys a little video <laughs> just to start off, but I am going to share my screen so you don't have to put up with my face anymore. So I'll stop that and let's share the screen our the screen and here we go chapter three so chapter three covers specifically lighting and sets um and and remember these lectures are really designed to give you an overview of what's in store uh for your um studio work there will be some um similarities to field production if you've done some of that typically when we teach production in in uh, in film school uh, we, it, it, you know, and it depends uh, what the focus of that program is, but for the most part, the directions we give you are more geared towards field because we, you know, you're not, you may not be, or you may not necessarily be working in a um, studio environment. However, um, in our case, we can give you both. So keep that in mind that a lot of what, or some of what we may go over today will have a little overlap uh, if any of you have ever done any field work. So with that, lighting and sets. And again, we'll talk about both. So we'll start with first talking about set and set and placements um, and how and how I want to think about the set or the studio. And, the, and in fact, something to keep in mind, even as you uh, work on your first shows or as if you're a writer and you're thinking about um, your uh, where your your show will be set and how you want it to be portrayed on screen you know with the instructions that you put on on your script keep these things in mind too in general like how the camera will move around um you know again the more you know the more you're aware and the more you're engaged with this whole process you know the the better your show will look and your film will look and uh just and, and also it'll be easier to for you to communicate with your um your crew what you want so for example, in terms of set placement, um, the thing we want to think about, especially for studios, is how much coverage we have. And, and all, most of these sets and studios you'll be involved with will have the 180 degree coverage. So you'll be able to see most of everything behind you. Keep in mind, too, when you're in the studio, uh, many times you'll be sharing sets. And also in, in, in school environments, you know, we don't have um, all the resources for to, to give for 100% to your production. So you may have to share a set, uh, which is true also for your smaller shows with, uh, with the smaller student-led productions. Um, just keep that in mind. So um, work with what you have, work with what you have. And, and one of the things that is oft overlooked and, and not really spoken about uh, in terms of direction is space or depth. Um, and how, how do you utilize space as a director and cinematographer? Uh, in your film, how, how are you going to show your audience where this uh, particular project of yours takes place or the project you're working on takes place? So it, these, these, all of these things will add to a, a feel, a rhythm. Um, if you're going for an aspect of realism where you want, um, or at the very least, you know, use reality to your advantage to tell your story. Remember, that's that's the way we want to think about it. How are you going to use what's available to you, either in the natural world or um, in your everyday life? How are you going to use that to tell your story in the best way? That's what you want to think about. And that's that's the way you want to approach this, like an artist. You know, like how it's it's uh, too often we think of it the other way around. How can we replicate this to make it look real? No, it's the opposite. Um, a, a true artist will always think about the best manipulation of reality to fit the work that they want to produce so that they get the, their message across in the clearest way possible. So keep that in mind. So Z-axis, you know, you have your X-axis and your Y-axis, your height and your length, uh, but your Z-axis, it's your depth. So um, again, having an understanding of how you're going to show your set, and your space will always give you a cleaner looking space, a cleaner looking show. Risers, flats, and desks. So when we think of, uh, on a studio, let's now we're talking about studios. So when we're talking about newsroom, especially you're watching the news, 
um, the news desk itself is the prominent feature. And but uh, note this that it's not on the ground floor. You know this the news desk is sitting where um, at at a place so that the camera, you know, and if you've seen the cameras, you know some of them are shorter, some are higher, but they're designed so that they're going to be eye level with the seated performer. You know when if you've ever watched any kind of a show that shows a desk um, or that you know that has a desk as a prominent feature of the furniture in the show, you'll notice that the anchors or the people sitting behind the desks and the talent, they always look directly into the camera. They don't have to look down, they don't have to look up, they don't tilt themselves. They sit very comfortably and, and can look uh, forward um, with that. And, and this will also create that one-to-one -one connection with the audience. So it's very important to consider, or if you're, you know, again, when you're doing your work, that that's what the, de that's how desks are, you know, us designed, you know, so that you are having that sort of direct eye contact. And in the background, you're going to see what are called Duratrons, monitors, chroma screens, etc. all kinds of different uh, um, background uh, in, uh, types of equipment that are all going to be used for different purposes. One of the one of the um, most often seen is a weather wall, or we also see a sports wall. But the weather wall is typically made up of one of two types of display devices: either a chroma key wall, which will be painted a certain color, typically green. If any of you have been in our room in 142, or excuse me, in 133, we do have uh, the corner painted green just for that specific purpose. So. Um, Hey, feel free to start shooting against that wall if you want to start practicing shooting on, on that kind of a wall. And, and also because of, of uh, technology and refresh rates on monitors, we now can even film monitors. If any of you have ever done that, you've seen how monitors come out actually looking pretty clear now on, on uh, what we film. And that's because of the refresh rates can match between uh, what the cameras are recording at how quickly the again this is how quickly the screen is refreshing itself in recording but also how quickly the screen is refreshing itself on the display and they can match up and therefore they come out looking just fine on the screen these days all of that is uh you know we we have to consider in terms of um what is our overall uh look and and design of of our specific uh set itself or what is a brand Ending of our show. And in this case, think about your uh, any kind of newscast um, or uh, if, if you watch a, you know, a sports show. Uh, you ever, did you ever notice how um, with, with these shows, you know, they all have their own branding, their own identity. So we have to consider the design protocol. That's why I put in here the light plus the set plus the graphics equals the look of the show. Well, that's all wrapped up in what is the design? What is, what is the brand identity? Uh, and this always comes back to form and function. Yes, we want something to look exciting and, and maybe new and fresh, you know, <laughs> but uh, we also don't want to lose viewers or put people off, you know, make something too garish or gaudy or something that just doesn't quite work, you know. Uh, so we have to consider what is the purpose of what we're shooting or what's the show, what's the show about, you know. If it's something like a Jerry Springer show, well, it's going to have a certain look, you know go look at the design protocols for that show or uh, in any of those kind of talk shows. Um, the, in the 90s was a big, big time for that kind of stuff, you know, uh, lots of garish kind of uh, design, but uh, it was because these shows were very exploitive in a lot of ways, you know, they covered topics from racism and to illegitimate children constantly. So, you know, they had this sort of overlit look, uh, everything was kind of bright the sets were stark, you know, sometimes they had just like, <laughs> it almost looked like uh, picnic chairs out there. Um, and in the case of the Jerry Springer, it almost looked like graffiti on a uh, brick wall, you know, because I think they filmed Jerry Springer in, in Chicago. Uh, but it, again, all of that lends itself to what is the message that you're conveying? Are you, are you trying to convey like an edgy, exploitive type of show like Jerry Springer? Or are you trying to convey uh, reliable, um, a reliable, calm narrative, um, a trustworthy look. So um, if we're doing that, then we want to take a look at uh, a lot of the new sets from the uh, 60s, uh, 50s, 60s on, uh, especially 
uh, because, you know, that was a time when everyone, you know, most people trusted the news, you know, none of this bizarre narrative that was ex that's been exploited by uh, especially the 45th president um, who as a savvy reality star knew how to exploit media um, and, and, and you, you know, called into question how um, journalism works. Uh, and, uh, but when we think about journalism, again, we go back and we think of people like Dan Rather or Walter Cronkite, um, Ted Koppel, these actors or actors, well, they are actors in a way, but these anchors from, you know, uh, 20, 30 years ago and, and sort of the messages that their sets conveyed and even how they dressed, you know, they all had these very smart suits on typically in dark, stark colors. Now let's take a, a quick turn here and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the technology, this specifically for the US um, and in terms of uh, services and electrical and what's uh, needed for gaffing or um, the electricity, the electrical work. Uh, studio lighting does require two to four times the amount of the electricity that is needed for most, um, you know, single homes. Um, so it's not uncommon to typically uh, to, to service a typical studio with as much as 600 amps of conditioned power electricity, which is electricity fed through a machine um, designed to prevent voltage surges. Um, now, uh, this will leave about two thirds of the service, which is about 400 amps ready for active use and, and the other will be there in case it's it's uh, needed. But again, um, uh, not always in use because we're trying to prevent those, uh, you know, any kind of a, a failure of the service so we don't have any surge. A, uh, a more practical or useful way to think about it is that each light used in the studio um, is usually serviced with a uh, breaker protected individual 20 amp circuit, which is typically 120 volts. Uh, so this 400 amps we mentioned earlier of active service will permit the illumination of roughly 20 lights. I mean, well, exactly 20 lights because of the math. Uh, 600 amps would give you 30, but uh, typically for most studios, 20 is just fine, it's enough. Another point to remember uh, regarding power service is that a 2K uh, watt lamp or 2000K watt lamp requires an individual 20 amp circuit. Uh, so consider, so we consider that these 400 amps of active ser service permits the si simultaneous illumination of these 20 amp circuits, each using 2000 watt lamps. Uh, this will be a total then illumination of 40,000 watts of lighting power. I mean, so it's a, we got a lot of numbers. Um, this is why studios are designed the way they are. This is why, um, you know, we, we have all of these fail safes in place because we don't want any, again, surges or, you know, uh, any fires to break out. If any of you have ever worked in theater, this lighting grid might look familiar. Um, this is an example with a bunch of 20 amp outlets. Uh, you can zoom in on this and take a look at how they're all spaced apart. Now let's talk specifically about the types of lights. So we'll talk about floodlights and spotlights. Floodlights in general are lighting instruments that generate a type of light. It's uh, non-parallel, distance apart. Um, this, the light is softer, diffuse. You have a, a, a wider uh, spread beam. So uh, you're, you're, it's not going to be harsh at all. Uh, it probably will be reminiscent of your home fluorescent lighting. Uh, not uh, because we're not casting heavy dark shadows. Again, it's the kind of thing where when you look at your hand and you see your shadow, it's it's kind of fuzzy and light, which will be different than the spotlight. Uh, now these are typically uh, tight beams. Uh, they're parallel. They're very close together. The light is hard, and and there's very very little spread. It's very very tight. So these are the lights that when they turn them on or when they're they are turned on, you'll see your your talent will sometimes wince away in, in sort of like, ah, and it's in pain that, oh, it's too bright. You know, that's, that's usually the, the light. It's so, it, it is a type of light that will generally give you a shape. So a circle, a square, whatever, you know, now we can have all kinds of controllers and we'll give you harder, more defined shadows. So we have to be careful when we're lighting something so that we don't put shadows in places we don't want them to be. So let's talk first about spotlights. And uh, what you see here, uh, first thing we'll talk about is a Fresnel, which is a focusing spotting lighting instrument used for, uh, for the most part for people and set materials. These are shaped like a trash can. Uh, they will have uh, four barn doors. Uh, and those are the, uh, 
the panels that cover the light. So you have like four of them that will go up and down. These are designed to help control spill or direct the light. And sometimes you can even use it to suppress some light if it's too strong. Uh, the most common setup would include a thousand watt uh, 1K as a primary type of Fresnel and then include a complement of lower wattage lights. We call those 500, 650, 750s, et cetera. Older studios with, will um, more than likely have a couple of uh, 2000 watt or 2Ks in the grid. And these are really big. So like you can see in the note, it's called 2K monsters. Um, the thing with these is they are pretty heavy. Uh, so we just be very, very careful with them. You know, we don't want anyone hurting themselves. Ellipsidals are a type of spotlight uh, that helps create shapes and patterns, um, art on a set. These are typically uh, effects light. Um, these are long, narrow tubes. Uh, they're sometimes called the Lycos or Lycolite. Um, these were given by the manufacturer uh, or Lecolite. I forget the exact pronunciation, but again, these are typically the effects lights. Now let's talk about floodlights. Um, a common floodlight that will be found in studios is called the scoop. Um, it, these look like large metal bowls with lamps on the bottom. Now, uh, these are often used to increase the amount of base light on a set or, you know, to help out or to supplement other lights. So they notch up the overall illumination of a given setup. So these are kind of like the uh, B team of lights, if you will. They, they kind of are there to supplement or to help with looks. We have also something called soft lights. Soft lights are going to be very, very common, especially on field work. Yeah, I mean, you'll also see these on sets with uh, interviews um, and, and you'll see these attached to the, the you know, the C clamps um, or C stands um, where you'll have the light encased in a giant box. Um, so it's a box shaped floodlight uh, and they're very big. Um, so these are bo box shaped lighting instruments that usually contain multiple lamps. I mean, and even that, that's the note from the book. Uh, usually we should put sometimes contain multiple lamps. Um, uh, like I myself have a couple of, of hard LEDs that I put in soft lights to help diffuse the light again to give you that softer look, more natural look, and, and to also um, uh, helps tone down some of the um, harsh uh, shadows or uh, harsh, uh, um, you know, um, harshness uh, of anyone's face and also it keeps the spots away or you know creating shiny light spots on people's skin so uh, let's talk about psych lights um, this is a floodlight designed um, uh, a psych light floodlight designed to illuminate psychs um, now these lights are either mounted on the ground and aimed up or are grid mounted uh, on, on one of those grid panels that i showed you earlier and also and just aimed downward now these are they can have you can put gels on these for um, uh, if necessary for, again, light for colored sources, if you want to give something a look for looks. These are also used to illuminate chroma key walls, and but in this case, you will not use any gels or any type of filtration. Um, the ground row of the psych is the lighting instrument that contains multiple inline amps uh, used to wash the light upwards. Sometimes they're controlled, sometimes they're not. And the sky psych is a floodlight mounted in the grid uh, now, sometimes in a soft box, uh, it's used to wash the psych with light from the top downward. Again, sometimes also um, electrical, so they can, sometimes they can move. Broads. Now, broads refer to floodlights that contain a two-prong halogen lamp uh, fixed between two reflectors. Uh, the usual place or placement for a broad is on the grid. It's not uncommon to see one also, a, a broad light floor mounted. Um, or on a, trop, on a tripod like mount. These are pretty big. Um, do a Google search if you wanna see what those look like. Um, I might've had one in the book, but uh, maybe I didn't like the way it was. So uh, do a search to find one of those so you can get a sense of what they look like. Fixed focal length lights. Now uh, with these, we call these PARs or parabolic aluminum reflector light. Um, now this is a type of lighting instrument uh, with a fixed beam spread. Again, the spread is how narrow um, the light is to like illuminate a person or how wide the spread can go wide where you can illuminate multiple people. So if, if it's a wider spread, then you can illuminate two or three people. If it's a narrow spread, you are only illuminating one person or maybe one part of their body. So that's what we mean by spread, if I didn't mention that earlier. 
Um, these can be purchased as wide flood lights, WFLs, or very narrow spotlights, VNSPs. Just remember the, the beam spread is fixed. It's similar to a, um, if those of you who have worked with uh, camera lenses, you know, we have prime lenses and zoom lenses. These are like the primes where the, um, um, uh, uh, the millimeter itself, you know, the, um, the focal length is set. So in this case, the beam spread is set, it's fixed. It's not uncommon to find uh, PARs mounted in, in groups or banks in order to create very powerful sources of light, you know, um, usually on location. And so uh, not, not always in studio situations, but uh, uh, these can be used for uh, out to place outside of windows, I believe, um, to uh, replicate sunlight or very powerful lights. So now we're gonna talk about the difference between halogens, fluorescents, and LEDs. Um, halogen bulbs generate a significant amount of measurable light per input watt. So halogens are actually very bright, very powerful, um, and very inexpensive. And, and you can find them most places, um, hardware stores and whatnot. Uh, the, the downside is these things get very hot. Um, they don't last long. They eat up a lot of electricity. Um, not durable. Sometimes you can drop a lamp and poop, it pops and that's it. Your halogen is, is gone. I've, I've, you know, I've done that. I used to keep some halogens on some shop lights or some shop uh, clamps and um, um, used to use that for some of my lighting setups or, you know, again, as supplements, as mentioned earlier, right? Those uh, dome shaped supplement lights. But um, yeah, you gotta be careful because uh, sometimes you put them away and you come back and you wanna use them again and they don't work anymore. It's one of those things and they do get very hot. So we have to be careful. Fluorescent lights are very commonly available in studios. Uh, they're more durable. Um, the light is typically very soft, the quality. Uh, they do not get very hot and they use less electricity. Um, however, they do not generate a lot or a significant amount of measurable light. Um, so typically for fluorescence, you need to be close to the object. Uh, typically you'll need extension poles um, and they may not be powerful enough for HD or, and, or and above for HD, 2K, 4K, et cetera. Although now, again, things are getting better. Fluorescence uh, come in uh, proper uh, color temperature and you can shoot on them, uh, mostly because our camera gain is very powerful. Um, and um, in the sense of, uh, you know, again, we want to teach that we want to illuminate properly, but um, our uh, you know color correction post color correction software is also very helpful. And finally, LEDs. Uh, this is very common. I believe we have a lot of LEDs in our cage. Um, now these give excellent light output per impot watt. I mean, many, many of you may have started getting LEDs in your home or have already replaced all all of your lamp lights bulbs in your house with LED bulbs, uh, and you'll notice they give off a different type of look. They don't get as hot as halogen lamps. They, in fact, they burn cold. That's sort of uh, the way it's described. And they're available in varieties of styles, including Fresnels and soft boxes. Um, they have a comparable throw with halogen lamps. Um, so you can put them directly on grids. Um, and, and, you know, again, they do give you enough bang for your buck in, in a way. Uh, although here they're listed as expensive. I mean, now, not so much. I mean, they're pretty inexpensive these days. But remember that what they cast, an LED casts a very, very height, a hot color. Uh, tip, this usually looks very white or very blue. And, and we will, even though uh, it, the, the, the temperature color will be very hot, we will, uh, as humans, when we look at that, we interpret it as a cooler look aesthetically, right? So like when we say we want a warmer look, we give it usually the 3,500, 4, 4,000 Kelvin look, which is amber, which we'll think like, well, that's warmer. However, it's a cooler temperature. Uh, and the way you want to think of it is uh, when, you know, the sun's rising or setting, so whether it's dawn or dusk, the temperatures are typically cooler, right? And the colors outside are usually in a lovely amber, orange, yellow, et cetera. But if we're standing outside at noon on a hot, on a hot day with no, with no clouds, for example, 
you'll notice that the light, you know, again, is very bright. But if we take a look at, if we think about the quality of light, it's very, it's, it's light, it's white, and it's bluish. Again, that's, and that's the hottest part of the day. So, or noon to like two or three o'clock. Uh, those hot parts of the days are, or the, the light, again, it's a, it's a light or it's white or blue, which is 5,000 to 6,000 degrees Kelvin, as opposed to the 35, 4,000 degrees Kelvin. So that's what that means. Also think of a campfire. Um, if you look at a fire, you know, it's orange, bluish. Uh, the hottest parts will always be blue. Now we talk about um, quality, the, the actual lighting setups themselves. The one that you'll be working on is three-point lighting. Some of you may have already done this before, so maybe it'll be a little easier assignment for you. But three-point lighting is a strategy that uses three lighting instruments per talent position and, and, you know, or per talent. Um, the lights in use are going to be a key light, a fill light, and a backlight. Now, the, the thing about three-point lighting, it does give a nice sort of aesthetic quality, um, it, but it does reek of studio look. Um, it looks contrived, but it does offer the cinematographer and director more control over what their talent will look like. So that's sort of the difference, while also, again, giving a little bit of, of um, of, of a lighting color to them with some shadow and some, and you know, if, if, if depending on how you put your backlight, you know, gives you some separation from your background. Let's first talk about the key light. The first light of three-point lighting strategy, uh, now this is very specific for studio, but these are also the rules that we follow for field. Uh, it's located 45 degrees up and to the left of the talent position. And this light is typically a spotlight. It's usually a nice, good, strong light. Uh, an instrument, as an example here, it gives a thousand watt uh, as a frontal. We use a light meter uh, to measure the intensity or the amount of light. Uh, and if any of you have ever watched behind the scenes footage, you will have seen maybe a cinematographer holding one of these devices in their hand. And it's just like a little, little uh, tape. It looks like a little tape recorder with a little ping pong ball on top of it. And, and they're still kind of useful to have. Um, you can still, nowadays, you can even purchase an attachment for your smartphone that plugs in and does have that same little, you know, ping pong ball, because that ball itself is white or gray, and it's, it's, gonna, it's measuring the light itself. That's why it's the color that it is. FC, or foot candle, is a measure of light based on the amount of luminance given by a single candle at a distance of 12 inches. Yeah, so that's very specific. Um, when we're talking about um, like lumens and whatnot, that's what that's referring to. It's that certain distance. A barn door is a four flap sheet metal lighting accessory uh, mounted to the front of any lighting instrument that permits get greater control in how a light is aimed. And also, this is also what we said earlier, barn doors help control spillage. We also find barn doors on cameras as well. I, I know I have one on mine. Uh, mine is a four flap, but I use a three flapper. And it does, again, help uh, control light as it comes into, uh, in this case, into the camera, which is, you know, receiving light. This would be the opposite. It's to help uh, steer the light. And also, if, if it's too strong, it can even diffuse. Spill, and I've mentioned that word a few times, that's any unwanted light. Uh, this is light that spills over its intended target. So like a water, like any liquid in a cup that you knock over, spill, it's it's typically unwanted. So that's what that is. The fill light in the three-point lighting scenario is a second light, and it's located 45 degrees up and to the right of the town position, or the opposite side of, of uh, the key light. This could be a spotlight or a floodlight, um, to, or sometimes you put a softbox, uh, because you want to use something that won't overpower the key. This is why we have the point of the soft box. You want to use something that won't overpower your key light. And, and in fact, you know, we'll just diffuse some of the shadow. Uh, we also have something called a tough spun, which is diffusion material that can be placed or affixed to the front of a lighting instrument that helps soften the character of the light and reduce the overall output of the light. Again, as measured with that light meter, um, the soft box has typically that a type of material like that to help diffuse the light and to soften it. As we continue talking about fill light, 
Um, so very similar to key, it's placed 45 degrees up and out uh, to the right of the talent position or the opposite side. If, if your key is on the left, then that's on the right. If, you're, if your key is on the right, then the fill is on the left. So it's just on the other side. To find the location of the fill light, sit at the talent position uh, where the person is gonna sit, hold your right arm straight up and from your body and move your arm to the right 45 degrees and up to the green. So go ahead and practice doing that. It's also, you also will do this for your key light. I don't think I made that very clear in a note earlier, but it, it works in the same way as you would the key, just the opposite. So the baton position you're pointing at is gonna be the position of the fill light. And again, if you're doing it for a key, it's just the opposite. After hanging the light in position, you'll focus the light to a hot spot, then name the spot to, to the right center of the talent's face. Or if you're on the left side, to the left center of the talent's face. Um, uh, you will tune and, and barn door the light uh, following the procedure outlined for the key light itself. So again, you're, but you're softening up. So if a softbox or other fly light is used, carefully aim the light to encompass the right center portion of the talent's face. Again, you because you're just filling in portions and, and removing the hard shadow that is typically produced by the key light uh, off of the talent's nose. So this will help uh, eliminate some of that harsh uh, lighting um, and that harsh shadow again to give more depth to the face so you can see more of the face. We move the instrument away or closer to the talent while using a light meter to attempt to match or reach slightly under the foot candle level of the key light. Remember, we want to be less than the key because it's this is a supplement. All right, this is to this is to help illuminate what might be placed in shadow due to the key light. So keep that in mind. That's what the fill light is for. Now a backlight. These are typically located 45 degrees up and to the rear of the talent position. This is provided as visual separation um, of the talent from the background. So again, like I was saying, if it's done properly, you can separate out your talent from the background. We can show the background, but then we see how we're separated out. This is uh, the backlight is located 45 degrees up and 90 degrees straight back from the talent position. A lower wattage frontal is a good choice for the backlight. Um, so here's a good way to uh, consider if the key is 1,000, the backlight ideal is 500. So it's sort of like half, half of whatever your key light is. Um, now, either to supplement the key light or in placement of the key light, you can use what's called a kicker. This is a light aimed at the background of a set from left and right position off screen. Um, now, sometimes we can call uh, on the field a kicker or a, a halo. Uh, we kind of can place a light to the opposite side of the um, of the key light, uh, that, and we point it directly to the back of the talent's head and shoulder, uh, which would be the opposite of the of whatever the key light is, and that'll provide a nice little uh, golden rim around the edge of the head and shoulder. Again, this will also help push out the the uh, the talent and separate them away from the background as well. Triple keys. This is a, a, a lighting strategy a strategy that uses three or four lights to illuminate a subject, 45 degrees left, 90 degrees head on, 45 degrees right. So very, you can see it, it's very, very uh, controlled, very mathematical. And, and that's just it. It's just three in the front combined with the backlight, the triple keys, it's an aspect or a modification of the three point light, lighting strategy. But uh, uh, we don't really uh, hit the um, that fill light as much all of these are going to be matched, typically three 1K frontals. What we are using now in, in place of these triple key lights are those ring lights that you probably have seen everywhere uh, due to the explosion of, of YouTubers and Instagrammers uh, and their smart devices. Um, now you can also use these ring lights with your uh, with our uh, studio cam or studio cameras or at least our field cameras, you know, our FS7s our A, uh, A7Threes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're gonna, I think we're gonna start seeing a fewer triple keys and seeing more of those ring lights just kind of everywhere. Uh, flood lighting, let's talk about that a little bit. 
Um, now these lighting instruments generate um, a type of light ray that is non-parallel. This part mentioned it earlier. It's a, it's a quality of light is softer diffuse and it's a widespread. Um, it's pretty flat in general or flat in character. Um, now, uh, here's something to consider. Uh, we can think about a circle on the, on the studio floor that encompasses the whole muse set. From that circle on the floor, um, we can, let's, let's, let's have that, that circle, extrapolate the circle to the lighting grid at a 45 degree angle. So it's like you raise that floor up and the general placement of lighting instruments will be along the imaginary line created on the grid. Um, so again, it's designed to give us even uh, lighting um, so we get a good sense of the studio and the space, uh, soft shadows, nothing harsh, so nothing very stylistic in that sense. It's just meant so that we can see it. Consider every sitcom show you have ever seen in your life. Um, everything from Saved by the Bell to, um, uh, if any of you watch The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, The Cosby Show, The Connors. Um, again, I'm not sure what people, what sitcoms are watching, but just watch one of these as part of your homework. Um, you know, again, they're 20 minutes long, but watch anything and, and uh, or, you know, go online and just watch an old episode of, you know, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air or some, or, you know, pick anything, Facts of Life, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll see that the lighting is all very even, uh, very few shadows, and we see the entire set. This is what we're talking about with flood lighting. Um, now, when we're lighting a chroma key wall, um, this must be evenly lit. If the effect that we're placing, in this case, the key effect, if it's going to work well, it's got to be evenly lit. So, um, e so typically, we'll, we're going to use an LED, soft boxes, something grid mounted, a psych light, which is a pretty ideal, or halogen soft box. So, uh, we don't really use fluorescent soft boxes because they're not strong enough. Because fluorescents in general are already a, uh, they're not as uh, intense a light source, so a fluorescent softbox would be even less of a of a, some or something that won't be very um, helpful in this scenario. The downward wash effect should be such that nearly all of the light is on the chroma key wall or psych and is well contained to the immediate floor area where the two areas meet. So in this case, the um, chroma key wall and the floor. Um, the light should be even smooth and not so intense as to make the wall appear white. So color is key. Um, and what, this is a danger, or this is something to consider is when you light this stuff, um, the reason why it says uh, we don't want the wall to appear white, well, that's what, that's what can happen if we place our light too close to the, the, green, even to the green screen wall, because even though it is painted green, if the light is too intense, it will wash out the color and give you a hot spot and which will appear as white on the video and your chroma key will not work very well. One technique for lighting the area where the weather anchor will deliver the forecast is to begin by marking a parallel line to the psych or wall about four to five feet out from the wall. So keep that, keep that four to five feet separation out. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's a, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. So I'm not quite sure what that's gonna look like in the studio. So uh, once you're there though, remember, these scenarios and something that you're going to have to make every single time. Once you've figured out, you'll just modify it until you get it just right, and then that'll be it. Continuing with chroma keys. Once centered, hold both arms straight from your body, move them up to the grid at 45 degree angle. Now separate your arms at about 55 degrees, so a little bit broader. The spots you're pointing to mark the light placements. Hang a low wattage frontal with diffusion in each position or diffuse broads with barn doors. Now, with all of this here, um, again, we're going to take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. Just I want you to go over all this, um, but keep in mind that it might be different in our studio. Um, all the lights can function as a fill. A key may be added, um, but keep in mind that you, uh, that you may put this at 90 degrees. Again, the rules might change in our studio, but keep this as a reference. It should be steep enough so that uh, we don't throw a shadow on the chroma key wall. So again, these are good rules to go by. Um, you can use small, highly diffused uh, broad with barn door or soft box as a key because that will keep the light less harsh. Um, and, and just remember that the idea is to, uh, in, to show that there's separation. So we don't want any 
shadows spilling from the talent onto the wall. So the subject needs to be far enough and uh, uh, needs to be lit separately. So keep that, uh, keep that in mind. We're going to light the wall as its own thing, and then you're going to light the talent as, uh, and they're going to have their own lighting as their own thing. Um, we want to be able to minimize the colors spilling from the wall back onto the subject too. We don't want that to happen because that can get kind of messy. And our final point will be effects lighting. Um, uh, we can just use common lights to illuminate the flat wall or background curtain. Psych lights and grid mounted soft boxes are pretty good. Ellipsodols can be used to accent the front of the news desk or project a station logo. Uh, those are great to use because you don't really see the beam themselves. You'll just see it appear. So just like in theater. Uh, we just want to make sure we don't overlight the set or have too many effect lights everywhere because this, this can be very distracting. It can look gaudy. Uh, but again, if we're going for that look, that can also be a challenge. How do we make it look intentional? <laughs> um, and, and so take a look at a game show to get a sense of how what that might look like. Um, you know, we have the, the <laughs> put this in here, add more lasers, you know, because uh, if, if that's what we're going for, then, you know, maybe you want to add more than you might think so that it feels like what you're doing is intentional and not by accident. So that's chapter three. Then in the studio text, remember to go over the lab section as well. And uh, remember to look over to the discussion post and to post before the due date. All right. Well, um, if again, as usual, if anyone has questions, please send me an email and uh, let me know um, if uh, you have any issues or problems coming up. All right, everyone, break a leg.